Good morning, church. Man, it's good to see you guys. It's good to be here. Man, 9 a.m. represents. You guys show up to church. You're caffeinated. You brought your kids. Let's go. Um, some of you guys literally just had babies. Let's go times two. Well done. I know. If I had a baby, I'd be like, I'm staying home for like several months. So you guys are, you guys really love Jesus, okay? Um, okay. Enough silliness. My name is Andrew Adams. I'm the associate pastor here at Reach. And um, yeah, I'm just so happy to be here with you guys preaching the Word of God. If you're new here, welcome. Um, If you don't like me, the normal guy will be back next Sunday. It'll be great, okay? Um, We are in a series called The Resilient Church. And I just really want to call out for a second. uh, Last week, Pastor Sean preached the best sermon I've ever heard on politics. The best. Amen. You know, we've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I'm just so thankful to be at a church where the leadership is faithful and where the people are faithful. So can we just, one more time, give God praise for what he's doing in Reach Church? Now, if you're a note taker, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 today. And the title of this sermon is called The Bigger Battle. We face a battle, all of us. Some of you experience it. Some of you might think that by talking about this with words like battle and fighting is fear mongering. But I would actually push back against that. You might be thinking, okay, after a sermon on politics, Andrew, are you guys suggesting that people across the political aisle are are enemies, that we need to battle them? Are you suggesting they are our enemy? No. And that's why we need to talk about this. We need to talk about spiritual warfare, what that means, what it is, what it isn't. We need to talk about this because, guess what? Next week, there will be an election. Actually, this week. Tuesday. Tuesday. (laughs) And after the election, guess what? No matter who wins, there will still be a spiritual battle. And here's what you need to know, church. It doesn't matter who gets elected. That president will not be your spiritual enemy. It doesn't matter... Who voted for that president? Those people will not be your spiritual enemy. We have a real enemy who hates your soul, who hates Jesus. And we need to talk about how to engage that enemy, and that's spiritual warfare. Now, I don't want to spend a ton of time trying to convince you that there is a spiritual war, because I think all of us intuitively know that there's one. Here's the heart of this sermon. For our church to realize After the election, and elections to come in decades and decades, there is a real spiritual war with a real enemy. And as the church, we need to learn the rules of engagement. We need to resist friendly fire. And we need to be rooted and grounded in the scriptures. For us to be a resilient church, we need to know our enemy. We need to avoid friendly fire. And we need to know our strategy. So with that in mind, will you all please stand as we read Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the CSB today. If you have your own Bible, I really encourage you to read. Um, Just have it open today. We're going to be in a lot of scripture, and it's going to be really helpful to have the word in front of you. This is Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 7. Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, 
who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. You can be seated. Will you please pray with me? Jesus, we want to come before you as your people, acknowledging that you are our holy king, you are our savior, you are our living hope, Jesus. And we want that to be the cornerstone of our lives. So I just pray as we enter the words of scripture today, would you give us understanding, would you give us discernment, and would you give us passion for the things of God? We also just pray, King Jesus, anything that's not from you, would it just fall on deaf ears? Anything that's from you, Lord, would it be inspired, carried on? Would it be fruitful to create Christ-likeness in us? We thank you for your word, we thank you for your body, and we thank you for what you have done in us, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we wanna love you more. And it's in your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. In 2018, The Atlantic published an article titled, An American Exorcism. Now this article stirred up quite a bit of controversy. And remember, this is 2018, okay? So we're pre-COVID, okay? Now, for a lot of people, this brought to, to the surface the question of spiritual warfare as a reality. Not just a horror movie, not something that happened in the dark ages, but something people were experiencing here and now. The article details the story of a woman named Louisa and how she experienced demonic oppression and how she sought out the Catholic Church. The article also describes the meteoric rise the Catholic Church had in its request for exorcisms. If you don't know what exorcism is, it's casting out demons. Now, In 2018, the uh, Archdiocese for Indianapolis received 1,700 requests for exorcisms. 1,700 requests. According to Barna, a Christian research group, an estimated 1.5 million Americans identify as Wiccans or self-described white witches. As of recent reports, TikTok, popular social media app, had over 73 billion views under the hashtag witch talk. Despite declining church affiliation, over 80% of Americans say they believe in the spiritual or supernatural dimension. Whether we like to acknowledge it or not, the reality is we all are aware of a greater spiritual reality whether it's a good one or an evil one. What I think these stats show us is as Christians, there's an evil behind the human evil we see today. Now, before we get deeper into this conversation, let's throw up some definitions so we can all be on the same page. What is spiritual warfare? What is warfare? Well, throughout the scriptures, we see that spiritual warfare happens uh, in two iterations, if you will. Spiritual warfare happens experientially, and it happens doctrinally, okay? So experientially, what does that look like? That means it happens in feelings and emotions. It happens in the body, in the physical, in the corporeal body you've been given. Doctrinally, what does that mean? It means spiritual warfare happens with truth claims about what is good and not good, what is true and not true. It means spiritual warfare is also intellectually based, something that you engage in with your logic. 
Okay, so spiritual warfare throughout the scriptures takes place in experiential reality and doctrinal truth claims. We all tracking? This is really important. Now, who is involved in this battle? Who is involved in spiritual warfare? Well, the scriptures actually give us three categories. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, I think for most of us, when we think of spiritual warfare, our minds go right to the demonic, right to the devil, right? Well, the biblical reality is he's only one-third of the equation. This is really important for us to get as Christians. Spiritual warfare isn't only yelling at demons. It also takes place in the world systems around us. That means it can take place in governments in ideas. It also takes place in other world religions. As Christians, we believe worldliness looks like false, false worship, false religion. So that could be Islam, that could be Mormonism. It could also be an ideology like secularism, materialism. Essentially, when we talk about the world as spiritual warfare, we're talking about cultures of sin. When we talk about the flesh, what does that mean? Well, the flesh is us. It's our own human sinful desires that resist God's will. And the devil, the one we all like to talk about, we're talking about supernatural beings, entities. The biblical story that most of us are familiar with is the devil is a fallen angel, a created being, who led other spiritual beings in rebellion against God. So let's track real quick. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we're thinking in one of three categories, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're thinking about experience and doctrine. We all tracking? Okay. Now, for today's purposes, we're mainly gonna focus on what spiritual warfare looks like in opposition to the devil. We'll hit on the flesh and the world a little bit, but we're gonna focus mainly on the devil. Now, with that in mind, who is the devil? Well, the name most of us know him by in the scriptures is Satan. Now, here's what's interesting. Satan is actually not a name, it's a title. So it'd be more proper to, instead of saying Satan to say the Satan. In Hebrew, it means the accuser or the adversary. Now let's remember, this guy, the Satan, is just one third of the equation. But he's actually really important to the biblical story on what spiritual warfare is. Now, as a church, even though we're gonna focus on the Satan, the devil, it's so important that for us as a church, when we think about spiritual warfare, to think about it holistically. Spiritual warfare isn't just yelling at demons. Spiritual warfare looks like raising your children in the way that they should go. Spiritual warfare looks like worshiping God. Spiritual warfare looks like being a light in your job, in your sphere of influence. This is what it looks like to holistically engage in spiritual warfare. And I think we can think of it like this. There are three traps that churches seem to fall into when it comes to spiritual warfare. They just seem to focus on one of the three parts of the equation. You see churches that are all about resisting the world. Think about like the Amish. We're gonna completely secede from the world. No electricity, no cars, horses and buggies, right? Think about churches that resist the flesh. Man, you come to church every Sunday and you're just, every Sunday, you're told, you're a worm, you're no good, God hates you. It's all focused on the flesh. And think about churches that only resist the devil. Man, they are screaming at the devil 24 seven. There's a devil under every rock and tree, okay? We don't wanna fall into these traps. We wanna address spiritual warfare holistically, recognizing that it's actually not just one of the three enemies, but it's all three of them. 
So our goal is to be a church that sees the whole battle and wages war according to the scriptures. Now, how do we do that? Well, I want to take us basically through a sweep of the book of Ephesians. And we're mainly going to be this whole sermon in Ephesians, okay? So get your Bible ready. Now, Paul, he's addressing this issue over and over to the church in Ephesus. And you might miss it, but we're going to zoom in on some passages. We're not even going to have time to focus on all the passages. That's how crazy it is. Now, for Paul, the conversation doesn't start with, what do I do when it comes to spiritual warfare? Paul starts with, this is what Christ has done in spiritual warfare. That's where the conversation begins. So we need to get that paradigm in our mind. As believers, followers of Jesus, disciples, we don't start with, hey, what should I do? We start with, what has Christ already done? So this is where Paul starts. Now, I want to give you some context to the book of Ephesians real quick. Ephesians is a letter written by Paul to a church in Ephesus, multiple churches actually. And it's a city very similar to Everett. They're a port city on the water. That means there's lots of people. There's lots of trade. There's lots of business, which means there's lots of ideas, lots of mingling of culture and religion and beliefs. The city, Ephesus, was well known for its obsession with magic, and the occult. Recently, in the last 200 years, there was a book discovered by archaeologists called the Ephesia Grammata, which translates to Ephesian words. And essentially, this book is a giant spell book. Man, you want to have a good harvest? Here's a spell. You want an attractive spouse? Here's a spell. You want to have multiple children? Here's a spell. And this was so deeply associated with what it meant culturally to be an Ephesian that they called these spells Ephesian words. So that's the people that Paul is writing to. They're living in, swimming in this deeply spiritual culture. In Ephesus, there was also one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. And you can actually read about some interactions with Paul and the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 18 and 19. It's wild. You should totally do that when you get home. Now, why that's a big deal. The city of Ar- or the, the temple of Artemis was massive, absolutely massive. And it was like this beautiful thing. And Ephesus had part of its city market in the temple. They also had their city bank in the temple. So what does that mean? That means as a Christian, you're like, man, I I need a withdrawal. I need to buy groceries this week. You have to walk into a pagan demonic temple. So the life you live is infested with this spiritual warfare. So for Paul, this isn't just a tertiary issue. This is Christianity 101. How to follow Jesus daily in a reality of conflict and warfare. So let's start in Ephesians 1, verse 3. And remember, Paul's mentality is not, what do you do? It's, what has Christ done? And uh, media team, I'm going to blast through this, so have your, have your finger on the trigger, okay? So what has God done for you? What has God done for you, church? Paul says, verse 4, God chose us. Verse 5, God predestined us. Also in verse 5, God adopted us. Verse 7, God redeemed you. Verse 7 again, God forgave you of your sins. And all the way down in verse 12, God sealed you in the Holy Spirit. So Paul is just launching off with this laundry list of these wonderful things that Jesus has done for you as a a disciple. God chose you before the foundation of time. He predestined good works and a calling for you. He adopted you. You were not his son or daughter, and now you are. Now you have rights and privileges in the family of God. He redeemed you. That's a, that's a churchy word that would have drawn to, to mind for Paul's audience, um, people on auction at the slave block. 
So back then they would fight these wars and if your team lost, you were now a slave of the other side. And what they would do is they would auction you off. Now often what happened is family members would come and they'd be like, man, we need to go buy dad back. We need to redeem him. We need to get him back for our family. And so that's what Jesus has done for us. He has bought us back. He's also forgiven us. He does not remember our sins and our iniquities. In verse 12, he has sealed us in the Holy Spirit. What that would have drawn to mind is this official imagery of a government official with his signet ring. And he would take his signet ring, dip it in wax, and he would seal it, making it official and authorized. And Paul is saying, you've been sealed in the Holy Spirit legally with authority. So the conversation of spiritual warfare actually starts right here. Look at verse 20. Paul moves on to say that he, Jesus, exercised his power, excuse me, he, God, exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens. Now, this is important. Verse 21, far above every ruler, authority, power, and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. So Paul, he's going off the rails talking about what God has done for you and what God has done in Jesus. Paul says, this is the exact power that God has for you, Christian, living in spiritual warfare. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, enthroned him in the heavens, is for you. But not just that. Paul is painting a picture of a cosmically victorious Jesus. Did you notice Paul's language? What does he mean by authorities and powers? Well, Paul's audience would have understood he's talking about spiritual authorities in the spiritual realm, spiritual powers and dominions. Now, before I lose you, don't get lost on, wait a minute, there's a spiritual hierarchy and they have a government. (laughs) Paul's audience would have believed that the spiritual evil in the world influenced human evil. Does that make sense? So humans are still culpable for their sin, but there seems to be an animating force, a spiritual energy behind the sin that humans perpetuate. Spiritual evil that influences human evil. This is a quote from a a New Testament scholar named Craig Keener from Asbury Seminary. He says, by Paul's day, Jewish people commonly recognized that demonic and or angelic powers were at work behind the political structures of the world. These powers were thus thought to direct the earthly rulers and peoples. So what does that mean for us? Well, I've got three big ideas from Ephesians 1 on how we start thinking about spiritual warfare. Number one, we need to think of what Christ has already done. Christ has already chosen you, church. He's already predestined, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, and sealed you in the Holy Spirit. The conversation in spiritual warfare for the believer starts here. You are at an advantage in this conversation. Does that make sense? Secondly, the conversation in spiritual warfare looks at Jesus seated above Above every spiritual and human being in the cosmos. So this is what Jesus has done for you. Laundry list of blessings. Number two, man, if there's a spiritual power out there, Jesus has pwned them, okay? They cannot hold a candle to who Jesus is. So what does that mean for us? Number three, Christians need not be afraid. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we don't have to get all nervous. We don't have to get anxious. We don't have to be afraid and imagine our worst fears. Because Christ has blessed you in the heavenly realms and Christ is king over everything. 
spiritual and physical. So as the church, we've actually done an awful job in this conversation of spiritual warfare. We've taken credence from Hollywood and horror movies and just nightmares instead of recognizing this is the biblical reality. This doesn't need to be a fearful conversation for Christians. That's for you, church, and that's for your children too. As you disciple your children and we talk about spiritual darkness, we need to communicate with our language and tone. This is not like a fear thing. This is Jesus has already won, and because he has won, you've won too. Because Jesus is victorious, you're victorious. So for a Christian, Jesus has already done the heavy lifting in spiritual warfare. And a disclaimer, if you're not a Christian, spiritual warfare is something to be scared of. You don't have any power in and of yourself. If you think you do, you start running out of options and you do like the Ephesians did. You're like, man, I need magic, I need spells, I need rocks, I need crystals. And the list goes on and on and on. And the power that you think you had starts to dwindle and you start to lose control and lose peace. So for the Christian, we recognize that we have power in Christ and Christ has already won. So far we've learned spiritual warfare is a threefold fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've learned that Jesus is above every being, human and spiritual. And we've learned that because of that, the church doesn't need to be afraid. Let's continue in Ephesians 2, verse 1. Paul continues, and he's speaking to the church and reminding them of who they used to be. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air and the spirit now working in the disobedient. So Paul reminds the church in Ephesus, those who are now Christians, you used to be spiritually dead. Pardon me. You used to be apart from Jesus. In other words, you were separated from God because of sin. You used to live life this way with everyone else in the world, following the way of the ruler of the power of the air. What on earth? <laughs> What is the ruler of the power of the air? And Paul continues, the ruler of the power of the air is this animating force behind those who disobey God. And he appeals to your fleshly desires in verse three, to carry out the inclinations of your flesh and your thoughts. Paul is saying we all used to be like this. We all used to be living in sin and sinning constantly. We were all controlled by this spiritual power, the ruler of the air. And the ruler of the air manipulated us to follow our sinful fleshly desires. But here's something we learn about this spiritual war. He's not just trying to get you to sin, he's trying the spiritual, uh, the ruler of the power of the air. He's not just trying to get you to sin. He's trying to keep you under wrath. So three more ideas from this passage on spiritual warfare. This is really important. Number one, those who are not in Christ are not just spiritually dead, but spiritually aligned against Christ. Now this is really important. In this spiritual war, in this spiritual conflict, there's no such thing as neutral. There's no Switzerland, okay? You're either with Jesus or against Jesus. And that's the reality of Scripture. Now remember, we need to keep in mind that all humans everywhere are created in the image of who? God. So they can be redeemed. But amidst that, we all, before we were redeemed, against God, at war with God. That also means if you're a Christian, 
You've come under new management. The power at work within you is not the ruler of the power of the air, it's Jesus. Number two, what we learn is the animating power behind the fleshly works of sin in the world is this power of the air, the ruler of the power of the air. And here's what we learn about him from this passage. He's not a neutral, ambivalent, kind ruler. He wants to keep you under wrath by sinning. That's really important. That's the enemy's strategy, to keep you under the wrath of God to keep the world and those who don't see Christ as their king, to keep them enslaved in wrath. His end goal is not just that you would sin, but that you would be a child of wrath. Now, this is really interesting. Number three, we learn that this ruler of the power of the air, what a title, is Satan, the Satan. Now, for Paul's Greek audience, in Ephesus, the ruler of the power of the air would have been a creative title that would have brought to mind images of Greek and Roman gods, namely Zeus, the god of the sky or the god of the air. And on the other hand, for Paul's Jewish audience in Ephesus, they would have thought of Zeus as well, but they would have thought of a more ancient enemy of the people of God. This deity throughout the scriptures that the children of Israel, they keep falling into false worship to. This deity's name is Baal, who's known as the sky god, or by his followers, the cloud rider. So with this creative naming, Paul is causing his audience, this is really important, to associate local false gods with the serpent in Genesis 3. Think of Genesis chapter three, the serpent tempts Adam and Eve, and he does it by appealing to fleshly desires. He does it with a lie that appeals to their temptation. And Paul is saying, hey, the spiritual beings that your neighbors worship, they have the same tone and tenor. They have the same culture, the same team as the serpent, the Satan, in the Hebrew scriptures. So let's take a step back. That's a lot of theology, but it's gonna frame the rest of our conversation. So far, we've learned what Christ has done for us, where Christ is seated in heavenly places above every ruler and authority, and we've just learned in chapter two who our enemy is, the ruler of the power of the air, Satan. And we've learned how he works. He appeals to our own fleshly desires. He appeals to our own disordered desires so that we would not just sin, but be enslaved in wrath. Does that make sense? So that's the conversation so far. That's what's framing Paul's talk to the church in Ephesus. Now, if you, last, if you missed the last five minutes, we learned spiritual warfare is a battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, a.k.a. Satan. And we've learned that Satan uses the world's cultures, religions, and governments to lead humanity away from God and enslaved in sin, ultimately to the point of wrath. Now, again, that was really theological and big, but it's important, it's key to our conversation on spiritual warfare. Satan is the entity, the person behind the world systems, behind the, the sin and evil of humanity. But let's bring that more lowbrow. Let's make that more practical. How does Satan, how does the demonic show up in your everyday life? What does spiritual warfare look like for you, someone who lives in Snohomish County in 2024, a few days from election day? What, how does Satan work in your life? It's really simple, through lies. Satan works through lies. A few weeks ago, Pastor Sean took us through John chapter eight to show us that Jesus is truth. And Jesus' truth sets us free. I'm gonna take us to John chapter eight to show us that Satan is the father of lies. And he lies 
to keep us enslaved. Let's look at John chapter eight, verse 44. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and this is what he says to them. You are of your father, the devil. You wanna carry out your father's desires. So we see that, that image of Satan manipulating and using our desires to accomplish his own ends. Let's continue. Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks out of his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Wow, there's a lot there. Jesus is appealing to Genesis 3. He's calling his audience back to see the serpent lying to Adam and Eve, specifically Genesis 3, 4. Satan poses this hypothetical question to Eve. Did God really say, if you eat of the tree, you'll die? And he sets up this lie for Eve. And she goes with him and he says, no, 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 no. If you eat of that fruit of the tree, You'll actually be like God. Your eyes will be opened. You won't surely die. And so we see here, Satan is a, not just a liar, but a murderer, causing the death, the spiritual and physical death of humanity. Remember earlier when we said spiritual warfare isn't just experiential, it's also doctrinal. This is super important for you, New Testament Christian. Spiritual warfare is mainly in your life doctrinal. Satan will propose a lie to you. Did God really say, do you really know Jesus? Does God really love you? Does God really have the best in mind for you? Those are doctrinal hypotheses. That, strictly having to do with the truth of scripture. <laughs> Spiritual warfare isn't just yelling at demons. It's a war over God's truth. And this is why this is so important. Jesus made it really clear. If we know the truth and are in him, we will be free. The devil doesn't enslave you through experience and force, he enslaves you through lies. He enslaves you through little white lies, through half-truths, through things that seem mostly true, but maybe there's just 5% untruth. If Satan can get you to buy a lie, he can get you to give false worship to another God. And I think in America, you're like, man, I... I don't know about you, but I'm not going to the temple of Artemis. That is not on my weekly calendar. False worship in 2024 looks like self-obsession. It looks like pseudo-narcissism, obsession with self, vanity. It looks like giving focus to ourself and not to God. Jesus speaks the truth, church, and his truth sets us free. Satan, in the words of Jesus, lies out of his own nature. And he wants you to be enslaved. So I want you to consider really quickly, church, why does Satan, why do demons hate you? Now remember, every human is made in the image of God. So when the demonic looks at you, He's reminded of his creator. He's reminded of the person who beat him. Now consider this. Scripture tells us that the reason Satan was a fallen angel is because he wanted to be king. He wanted to be God and sit on God's throne. Well, that's not a reality. That's not truth. And so Satan begins to live a life, perpetuate a life of lies. Now get this, the only other place in the cosmos where God is seated and enthroned is the human heart. Yeah. 
And if Satan can remove God from the throne of your heart, he thinks he's winning. He thinks he can keep you under wrath. Does that make sense? Does the warfare and the lies that he uses make sense? It's not just paranormal activity and doors opening by themselves. It consists in doctrine and worship. The call of scripture for those who would be wartime Christians is to resist the Satan, to resist his lies, and to know the truth. Now, to know the scriptures and to know God and the gospel story, we have to get it into our Bibles. We have to know what God has said, what he's done. Because the reality is this book reveals God's nature, his character, and his heart toward you. How many of you didn't know before today that you were chosen in Jesus, predestined, adopted, forgiven, sealed in the Holy Spirit? Do you see the power of knowing the truth of this scripture? It's the difference between freedom and enslavement. Can I also tell you, Christian, If you want to wage war well with the flesh and the world, if you wanna sniff out propaganda, discern your own self-destructive desires, you also need to know the word of God. You need to be in touch with your creator. You need to be in touch with Jesus who is the truth himself. I know some of us really struggle with this side of spiritual warfare. And it sounds like this. Andrew, how do I tell the difference between the voice of God, my own flesh, and the enemy? God's voice is revealed in scripture, church. That's how you discern what God's voice sounds like and what it consists of. God's voice, his thoughts, his desires, his plans are all in this book. So if you want to know God, guys, we got to know the scripture. What if spiritual warfare wasn't just screaming at the devil? What if it was knowing God's thoughts and plans and his love for you? What if spiritual warfare starts with knowing who Jesus is, seated, ruling on high, knowing what he has done for you, and then obeying by opening the scripture. What if this whole spiritual war thing is a lot less complicated than we thought? What if it looks like spending time with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I just wanna pose that to you, church. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, Andrew, I get it. Every sermon, read your Bible, read your Bible. It's true though, okay? Now, you might be thinking spiritual warfare has got to be a lot more than that. And to some extent, that's true. Reading the Bible, though, knowing Jesus is square one. You can't just jump into spiritual warfare without knowing your Savior and knowing what he's done for you. You don't get to skip that step. If you do, man, you will fall bait to the enemy every time. So, Let's look at Ephesians chapter two and verse 16, excuse me, verse six, to see how Paul continues to instruct the church in how to think about spiritual warfare. Ephesians two, five through six, Paul continues that Jesus, or excuse me, God made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. He says, you were saved by grace. That means God has given this to you as a gift. You didn't earn it. He saved you as a gift. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Okay, so now there's really no reason to fear because not only is Christ enthroned above every spiritual power and principality, but you are as well. In Jesus, you are seated in heavenly places. (laughs) 
We really need to sit on that. We really need to reflect on that church. And that, just doesn't, that doesn't just mean like the demonic, that also means when the demonic animates powers of this world. What that means is the church, the underground church in North Korea are victorious over an evil, wicked government. What that means is Christians hiding in the secret in China are eternally enthroned over those who would want to kill them. What that means, churches, you don't have to fear those who would kill you, who would scare you and intimidate you because you are enthroned with Jesus. After Paul explains who we were before Christ, he goes back to talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. In other words, this is your identity. This is who you are, Christian. So when the devil comes with lies, you're this. You're annoying. No one likes you. Or maybe it's you're incapable. You're insufficient. Maybe it sounds a lot more derogatory like you're stupid and you shouldn't be alive anymore. This is where you need to go. This is truth, church, about who you are. And if you get that truth from anywhere else, that person will be your master. Where you get your identity from is where you get your power from. So if you get your identity from just randomness in life, for me, it was playing sports. High school, Andrew was all about basketball, all about basketball. But that also meant when I had a bad game, when my coach was mad at me, when I was hurt, I was nothing. It was so fragile, so temporary. But in Christ, man, th those things don't change. Even when I sin and I mess up, God doesn't unadopt me. He doesn't unforgive me. You need an identity that's fixed in stone and that only comes from Christ. That power only comes from Christ. So remember, God seated Jesus at the right hand in the heavenly realms over every spiritual being and you're there with him, enthroned over every spiritual power. So, what does spiritual warfare look like after you know the truth? Number one, you need to recognize your authority in Christ. Church, you have power when you're rooted in the truth of the gospel, when you're rooted in the authority that Christ gives you. You have power over spiritual beings and spiritual entities. You might be thinking, okay, is this where I get to yell at demons? Hold on. Let's turn to the end of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. Paul has finished telling the church what Christ has done and now he's moved into how does this play out in reality. So in essence, Paul's going, this is who Jesus is. This is how he saved you. This is the life you now have. Now, this is how you are to act as a Christian in your relationships. So Paul starts getting really practical. He starts talking about the Jews and Gentiles. Essentially, there was racism in the early church. There was prejudice. There was ethnocentrism. And Paul's saying, wait a minute, because of what Christ has done, unified you in God, you need to be unified with each other. And then Paul starts talking about spiritual gifts and how the point of spiritual gifts is to build each other up to Christ's likeness. And then, he starts talking about putting off your sin life. Stop sinning toward each other. Don't be angry with each other. Don't manipulate each other. Don't lust after each other. So Paul is hyper-focused on relationships. And then Paul starts talking about marriage. He says, husbands and wives, because of the love Christ has for you, this is how you're to love each other. And then he gets really practical, parents and children. Because of what God has done for you, this is how you love each other. And then he talks, starts talking about slaves and masters, essentially indentured servants and masters. This is how you're to love each other. So Ephesians is, this is what God has done for you. So this is now how your relationships are to be lived out. And then comes Ephesians 6. 
So the context of this warfare is relational in community. You don't go into warfare as a lone wolf. We go into warfare as a community of Christians who are knit together in the love of Christ. Warfare doesn't happen in isolation. That's actually where losing happens. That's actually where defeat happens, in isolation. But when you are in community, in relationship with other Christians, man, there's power there. And so Paul gets into chapter six. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord. Chapter six, verse 10, and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of darkness, and evil and spiritual forces in the heavens. He reminds the church, spiritual warfare ultimately is not against people. People made in the image of God, it's against spiritual evil, the Satan, who hates you, who doesn't want God to sit on the throne of your heart. There's a lot of theology there, but we're going to stay focused. So secondarily, how can I, as a New Testament Christian, engage in spiritual warfare? Stand in God's strength. Paul uses similar language from Ephesians 2 to identify the enemy, spiritual forces and authorities and dominions. And Paul will explain how to stand. How to stand in strength by using several analogies. Now, a lot of us might be familiar with this passage, so I'm just gonna try and keep it at a high level. Just gonna try and keep it. How do these analogies relate to warfare without going into a ton of historical context? Does that make sense? So I'm not gonna talk about the armor and what it looked like on a Roman and there's like cleats on the shoe. We're not doing that, okay? We're gonna talk about how this relates to your everyday faith. How this relates to you as a Christian who seeks to resist the devil. So Paul starts listing off in Ephesians 6, 14 through 18. I'm not going to read it all. I'm actually just going to go through this list. He says there's this belt of truth that you have to have. Now remember, the devil is called the father of lies. And Paul says, as a wartime Christian, you need to stand in God's truth. What is God's truth? It's Ephesians 1 through 2. This is who you are. Called, chosen, predestined, adopted, forgiven, sealed in the Holy Spirit. Stand in that truth. Stand in the truth of what Jesus has done for us. And then in verse 14, Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness. By the way, I'm in the ESV because CSB gets really funny with the spiritual armor. So... We're sticking to the ESV if, if you're confused why the words are different on screen, that's why. So Paul uses this word of righteousness. Man, that's a churchy word. If you're not a Christian or new to church, you might be thinking, what does that mean? In essence, righteousness is your ability to keep God's law. Your ability to not sin. Your ability to be in good standing with God. Now, if that sits strangely with you, remember, Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your sins. None of us have any righteousness to speak of in and of ourselves. The righteousness that we have is alien. It's external. It's not of our own. It's a righteousness given to us by Jesus. And Paul says, wear that righteousness. Stand in what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, Paul says, take off your former way of life. Imagine like a really slimy old t-shirt with like coffee stains and like baby spit up. Take it off and put on, verse 24, the new self. One created according to God's likeness in righteousness, in purity of truth. So, Church, you don't stand in your own righteousness. If you do, you're gonna get taken out of the battle. But you stand in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Then in verse 15, 
Paul says the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. What on earth, Paul, you need to learn how to write an analogy. The shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? Think of the shoes that give readiness. Think of like lounging at home. You're not ready, you're relaxed. You're wearing your slippers, your fuzzy socks. Maybe you're just barefooted. Those dogs are out there, okay? If you wanna be ready, you put on shoes, something that makes you ready to engage. Paul talks about readiness and peace like this in Ephesians 2. He says, for he, Jesus, is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 16, he says he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross. A huge theme in Ephesians is this unity, this peace where there used to be racism and prejudice. Paul is saying, there's not just peace between you and other humans, there's also peace between you and God now. But what does readiness have to do with that? Let's put it like this. It's an act of spiritual warfare to love and receive someone quickly into the family of God who is an outsider. Those who are outside the family of God and repent, we don't haze them, we don't make them do their time, we're not like, okay, newbie, go clean toilets. We receive them into the family of God. It's the readiness of the gospel of peace. Sean, he's preached this passage before, and he put it like this. Our battle isn't against other people, it's for other people. It's this ability to reach out in unity and say, there's peace between us now. Not because of what I can do, but the gospel of Jesus. So church, Stand in that peace that you've been given through Jesus. Verse 16, Paul talks about the shield of faith. Faith, that's another church word that simply means trust. Let your trust in God be like a shield. And by trusting God, you'll be able to put out the lies of the enemy. Paul talks about the fiery darts or literally translated arrows of the devil. So for wartime Christians, they always have their hope and trust in who God is and what God has done. That enables us to resist the lies of the enemy. And then in verse 17, Paul talks about the helmet of salvation. This one's super easy. I have no saving power of my own. You have no saving power of your own, but the salvation we stand in comes from Jesus. It comes from the saving work of Christ. Ephesians 2, 5 says, we've been made alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trans transgressions, we've been saved by grace. It's a gift. It's not my own helmet. It's something given to me by Jesus that protects me and seals me. And this is so important for wartime Christians to stand in the work of Christ's saving grace. If we start to stand in our own merits and efforts, we will quickly realize how easily we are defeated. We'll realize that we are vulnerable and unprotected. But when we stand in the fact that I've been saved simply because God loved me, man, I'm good to go. I can engage in spiritual warfare. I can resist the lies of the enemy. I can enter the public square and stand for Jesus because of what he's done for me, not what I can do for me. Consider this. Actually, let's move on to verse 17. Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, he tells us, is the Word of God. It's the only weapon listed in this chapter in regards to spiritual warfare. Christian, the Word of God is your weapon in this warfare. You have no other weapon. No crystals, no tarot cards, no arguments, no uh, tactics and philosophies. Your weapon is Scripture. That's where your spiritual power, your spiritual weapon comes from. 
Consider Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in a very real way, experientially and doctrinally, having warfare with Satan. Satan starts lying to Jesus and tempting him. Luke chapter 4 verse 3 says, The devil said to him, If you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written. Jesus says that each time the devil prompts a lie, a temptation, Christ responds, it is written. That is your weapon, Christian, the truth and foundation of the scriptures. Even Jesus, in wartime, stood on the words of God as his weapon. The words of this Bible are powerful, not because they're written in black and red ink, but because they were spoken and inspired by the God who creates with his speech, by the God who created life and light by simply speaking it. That's why scripture is powerful. Not because it's printed on paper, not because it's the CSV, the ESV, the KJV, it's because they are inspired, powerful words by the creator God. Does that make sense? Okay. Paul calls the church to pray, lastly. For some of us, we're like, okay, this is where I get to yell at demons now, right? Well, we need to consider this, how prayer works for the Christian. Prayer's not a formula. It's not magic. Prayer is a relational appeal to God himself. So when we consider this in terms of spiritual warfare, we're asking God to move on our behalf. So prayer isn't as much yelling at demons as it is pleading with God to save us and work for us. Does that make sense? Is this painting a clear picture that spiritual warfare is what Christ has done and you standing in what Christ has done? You standing to resist the devil. Now, I've tried to make this really clear for you guys. The language of standing. We don't run around and engage in our own spiritual warfare adventure. You know, it's not like geocaching where you're looking for the demon of this and the demon of that. If you are living life as a missional Christian, living life faithfully as a single person, loving your spouse, raising your children, you will encounter spiritual warfare. You don't need to go looking for it. It will come for you because the enemy does not want you missional. He wants you in sin under God's wrath. And so, for the Christian, we stand on what God has done for us. We stand in his holiness, his righteousness, his power. And what this does, church, on the other side of an election, in a hostile territory, the Pacific Northwest, this creates Christians who are loving, charitable, and ready to redeem their society. We don't go about hating other people. We don't go about condemning other people, but seeking their salvation by standing on what Christ has done. So last point, I'm gonna close right here. Point number three, how do we engage in spiritual warfare? We submit to God. We're going to leave Ephesians and check out James chapter 4, verse 7. James, the brother of Jesus, is writing, and in general, to the church at large. This is a letter for all the churches. And he's specifically addressing how to be righteous, how not to live a life of hypocrisy. And it's in this conviction to live holy with integrity that James writes this in verse 7. He says, therefore... Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Like, wow, that's a really emo passage. What James is doing is he's teaching the church spiritual warfare through repentance. So spiritual warfare is standing on what God has done, knowing his truth and repenting of sin. Now, I think when we read this passage, we kind of want to separate it. Just draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Yeah, that's definitely true. God wants to be with you, Christian. But remember, God's will for you is to be holy, to be Christ-like, to be mature. Christ isn't trying to shame you, but he is trying to free you from maturity. When we repent of our sin, in the language of James, when we cleanse our hands, purify our hearts, let our laughter become mourning, We're not just moving through the motions. We're engaging and saying, Jesus, what you call sin is sin. You're holy and I need your forgiveness. I need your repentance. And look at how that works out. When we repent of sin, we are able to resist the devil and he will flee. And it's also in that action, church, that we are able to draw near to God and encounter his manifest presence, to encounter his nearness. I think some of you here don't realize that what you're experiencing right now is not just spiritual warfare, but the absence of God's presence in your life. God's presence comes through his son who died on the cross for you. He lived the perfect life that you couldn't live so that you could have relationship, freedom, and righteousness in God, so that you could have his presence in relationship. And so when we repent of our sins, Christ draws us near to the Father. So as we close, church, I want us to reflect on this. This is a really big thing here at REACH. The abiding life. In John 15, Jesus talks to his disciples and he encourages them to abide in him, to abide in the words of God, to remain in him. I think we've forgotten this is a valid point of spiritual warfare, abiding in God. It's not just watching TikToks and watching sound bites and theology videos. It's spending time with Christ, enjoying his presence, seeking his will and connecting yourself to him. So as we close here, I wanna ask you church, do you need to stand in what Christ has done? Do you need to recognize the authority you've been given in Christ as a part of your identity? Do you need to submit to him and repent of sin? So we're gonna have the prayer team come up here. We're gonna have the communion team come up. And I want you to see this church as a real opportunity for you to engage in spiritual warfare by drawing near to God and repenting of sin. I just wanna close with really simple application. Drawing near to God might look like giving him lies that the enemy, the world has given you about who you are, maybe about who God is. Maybe you've believed that God is angry, his disposition towards you is unsatisfied, but that's not the reality of scripture. We need to repent and exchange that lie for truth, that God has loved us and given his son for us. So church, will you please stand with me as we draw near to God? King Jesus, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you that we don't enter this warfare based on what we can do, based on our merits or what we can accomplish, but we stand in what you have done, Jesus. We stand equipped, victorious, in authority with you. I just pray for those today, Jesus, who have submitted themselves to the lies of the enemy that they would repent. For those who are far from Christ, Jesus, I pray that they would come near.
that they would repent of their sin and give their allegiance to you. I pray that they would stand in you, Jesus, and what you have done. I pray that we would be a church, Lord, that sees warfare, not as people who disagree with us, different races and creeds and ideologies, but we would see it for what it truly is, the enemy of our souls that we get to resist. We get to redeem those who are made in the image of God, enslaved to Satan. So I pray, Holy Spirit, would you fill our church? Would we be a church of repentance, a church of authority, and a church who is abiding in you?